So the date is August 16th, 2002. And flying over a valley in Afghanistan are two A-10 warthogs. An A-10 is a heavily armored, low-flying, slow aircraft designed to provide ground cover for troops on the ground. And on this night, it's a very, very cloudy night. The storm's in the area. And these two planes hanging up above, just waiting in case anybody down below needs help. Up there, it's gorgeous. The moon is, is bright. There's thousands of stars in the sky. The clouds look like the snow had just fallen. Down below in the valley, however, there were 22 special forces, special operations forces, troops, trying to make their way through the country. And they could feel that something was wrong. They could feel, they felt uneasy. One of the pilots up above call sign Johnny Bravo, and yes, he stands like this. He could feel their unease listening to them over the radio, so he decides he was gonna go down below the cloud and just have a look. He tells his wingman, hang out up here, I'll go see what there is. And he points his plane down into the clouds. And as he's going through the clouds, the call comes over the radio, troops in contact. Troops in contact is what they say when they come under effective fire. It means they're in trouble. So now Johnny Bravo points his plane straight down, the plane's getting thrashed about in the turbulence. And when he comes out below the clouds, he's less than a thousand feet off the ground and he's flying in a valley, cliffs on both sides. Now this is only 2002 and the planes were not yet equipped with ground hugging radar and worse, they were using old Russian maps. That's all they had at the time. And the sight that greets him is something like he's never seen before, not in training and not in the movies. He sees tracer fire, fire coming from all sides of the valley pointed right in the middle where the American forces are. And so he picks a point and starts to lay down suppressing fire. And he's flying and he's in danger of hitting the cliff, of course. He knows his speed, he knows his distance from the map, and he literally counts out loud while he lays down the suppressing fire. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five, one thousand. Pulls hard on the stick, pulls back up into the cloud, comes down around again. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand. Good hits, good hits, it says over his radio. And again, he comes around. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five, one thousand. He runs out of ammunition, fuel is fine. Flies back up to the top of the cloud, tells his wingman, you need to get down there. His wingman isn't sure about the conditions, so the two of them fly back down together. His wingman lays down the suppressing fire, and Johnny Bravo counts as they fly three feet apart from each other, wing to wing. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,000, five, 1,000, up and around again. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,000, five, 1,000. 5, 1,000. That night, 22 Americans went home alive with zero casualties. My question is, is where do people like Johnny Bravo come from? Who are they? Who would risk their lives for others so that may, they may survive? I asked Johnny Bravo, I asked him, why, why would you do it? Why would you risk your life so that others may survive? And he gave me the same answer that everybody in his position gives, because they would have done it for me. Now, if you think about it, in the military, they give medals to people who are willing to sacrifice themselves so that others may gain. In business, we give bonuses to people who are willing to sacrifice others so that we may gain. We have it backwards. Wouldn't you like to work in an organization in which you have the absolute confidence, the absolute knowledge that other people that you may or may not know who work in the same organization as you would be willing to sacrifice themselves so that you may survive? And, in, and I'm not talking about giving your life. I mean, we don't even like to give up credit. You know? So where do people like Johnny Bravo come from? Well, it's an age-old question. They're not born, they're actually made. If you look at the human animal, the human animal is like a machine. There are systems inside our bodies that are trying to get us to do things that are in the interest of the survival of the human animal, right? Um, just like in, an industry, in a business, in a company, if you want people to do something, you offer them some sort of positive or negative incentive to direct the behavior, right? So if you want people to achieve a certain goal, you offer them a bonus if they achieve that goal, and they'll work towards that goal because they want the bonus. It's a very simple system. The human body works exactly the same way. It works exactly the same way. Inside our bodies are chemicals that are trying to get us to do things that are in the best interest of us. If you've ever had a feeling of happiness, Pride, joy, love, fulfillment. 
All of these feelings that we have are chemically produced feelings. And they're produced by four chemicals predominantly. These are basically responsible for all of the feelings that I would generically call happiness. They are endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin, EDSO. These two chemicals, endorphins and dopamine, I like to call these the selfish chemicals because you don't really need anybody's help to get them, right? Let me tell you, let me tell you a little bit about what they are. Endorphins. Endorphins are designed to do one thing and one thing only. Mask physical pain. That's it. That's what they do. If, you, if you're a runner, if you've ever gone and done heavy exercise, you've heard of an endorphin rush or a runner's high. Basically what's happening is when that runner is out there pushing their bodies harder than they've ever pushed before, they feel good. And when they're done with their run, they feel fantastic. And then an hour later they're in pain for damage they caused their muscles an hour before. Right? This is what endorphins are designed to do. They're designed to mask physical pain. The caveman reason for this stuff, because this stuff is all from 50,000 years ago, understand Homo sapien existed at the same time as other hominid species and yet we survived and they didn't. What is it about this species that's so good at survival and thriving? Look at the world we've built. It's not just that we're smart. We're certainly not the strongest and we're certainly not the smartest. It's that we're social animals. We have to do things together, together. We have to look after each other and we have to work together to ensure that we survive, that we do well. This is how we're designed, right? These chemicals are trying to make that happen. So in these caveman times, 50,000 years ago, Paleolithic era, we had to eat. We're not the strongest, we're not the fastest. But there's one thing that the human animal is made for, endurance. We could track an animal for hours and hours and hours and miles and miles and miles. And if we were tired, we'd keep going. And if we got injured or we had to bring the food back to the cave, we'd continue to do it. And it was so good, it felt so good, that maybe we'd even volunteer to go hunting the next day, just like we get addicted to exercise, right? Oh my God, it was so much fun yesterday. I will totally go hunting tomorrow, right? Good system for the survival of the group. Good system. By the way, the reason laughing feels good is because of endorphins. You're actually convulsing your internal organs and endorphins are masking the physical pain. I'm sure everybody here has laughed so much that the endorphins eventually run out and you go, stop, stop, it hurts. <laughs> endorphins, they feel good. Dopamine. Dopamine is the feeling uh, that you found something you're looking for or that you accomplished something you set out to accomplish. So you know that feeling you get when you cross something off your to-do list? That's dopamine, feels awesome. You know when you, when you have a goal to, to hit and you achieve that goal, you're like, yes! You feel like you've won something, right? That's dopamine. The whole purpose of dopamine is to make sure that we get stuff done, right? Um, the, uh, the historical reason for dopamine, we would never eat if we only waited to get, until we got hungry because there's no guarantee that we would find food. So dopamine exists to help us go looking for food. We get dopamine when we eat, which is one of the reasons we like eating. And so when you see something that reminds you of something that feels good, we want to do the behavior that helps us get that feeling, right? So let's say you're out there going for a walk and you see an apple tree in the distance. You get a small hit of dopamine. And then what it does is it focuses us on our goals. And now we start walking towards the apple tree. And as the apple tree starts to get a little bigger, we feel like we're making progress, you get another little shot of dopamine and another little shot of dopamine until you get to the tree and you're like, yes! Okay? This is why we're told you must write down your goals. Your goals must be tangible. There's a, there's a biological reason for that. We, we're very, very visually oriented animals. You have to be able to see the goal for it to biologically stay focused. Right? If you don't write down your goals, if you can't see your goals, it's very hard to get motivated, to get inspired. For example, think about corporate visions. Right? A corporate vision is, has to be something we can see. Right? That's why it's called a vision. You can see it, right? To be the biggest, most respected, to be the fastest growing are not visions. They're nothing, right? What does that even look like? Respected by whom? Your mother? Yourself? Your friends? Your shareholders? Who knows? What's the metric? Dunno. It's amorphous. Doesn't motivate us. Just like I can't tell you, you will get a bonus if you achieve more. You're going to ask me, how much more? I'm going to say, more. Doesn't work. You need a tangible goal. You need a tangible goal, right? Here's a great vision. Martin Luther King, I have a dream that one day little black children and little white children will 
play on the playground together and hold hands together. We can imagine that. We can set our sights on that. And every time we achieve a goal and achieve a metric and achieve a milestone that makes us feel like we're making progress to the, go the vision we can see, we keep going and going and going until we achieve something remarkable. You have to be able to see it. Dopamine. Like I said, dopamine is the feeling you get when you set out to find something you're looking for as well. I talked about the to-do list. I came home from a trip just a couple days ago and I had a bunch of errands to run and I wrote down a little list of things I had to do and off I went, right? And as I was walking past, I think it was the dry cleaners, I don't remember. I was walking past something, I remembered, oh, I have to do that and I hadn't written it down on my, my to-do list. So I went in and finished what I needed to do and then when I came out, I then wrote it on my to-do list and then crossed it out because I wanted the dopamine. Feels good. <laughs> dopamine comes with a warning. Dopamine is highly, highly, highly addictive. Here are some other things that release dopamine. Alcohol, nicotine, gambling, your cell phone. Oh, you think I'm joking. Okay, we've all been told that, uh, you know, uh, if you wake up in the morning, and you crave a drink, you might be an alcoholic. Well, if you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is check your phone before you even get out of bed, you might be an addict. If you walk from room to room in your own apartment holding your telephone, <laughs> you might be an addict. When you're driving in your car and you get a text and your phone goes beep, we, we hate email, true. We love the beep, the buzz, the ding, oh. <laughs> right? You'll be there in 10 minutes, and yet you have to look at it right now. You might be an addict. And even if you read it and it says, are you free for dinner next Thursday, and you have to reply immediately, you can't wait the 10 minutes, you might be an addict. And for all you Gen Ys out there who like to think that you're better at multitasking because you grew up with the technology, then why do you keep crashing your cars when you're texting? <laughs> You're not, you're not better at multitasking, you're better at getting distracted. In fact, if you look at the statistics, ADD and ADHD have, uh, diagnoses of ADD and ADHD have risen 66% in the past 10 years. Okay, ADD and ADHD is a frontal lobe disorder, right? Are you telling me out of nowhere, 66% of our youth have a frontal lobe problem? Where did that come from? No, it's a misdiagnosis, right? What, what, are, the, what are the symptoms of a dopamine addiction to technology Distractibility, inability to, uh, to get things done, easily, easily distracted, you know, shortness of attention. It's all the same thing, so we misdiagnose things. It's this. It's the addictive quality of dopamine. We can also get addicted to performance in our companies when all they do is give us numbers to hit, numbers to hit, numbers to hit, and a bonus you get, and a bonus you get, and a bonus you get. All they're doing is feeding us with dopamine, and we can't help ourselves. All we do is want more, more, more. It's no surprise that the banks destroyed the economy because one of the things we know about dopamine addicts is they will do anything to get another hit, sometimes at the sacrifice of their own resources and their relationships. Ask any alcoholic gambling addict or, or drug addict. Ask, ask them how their relationships are doing and if they've squandered any of their resources. It's an addiction. Dopamine is dangerous if it is unbalanced. It is hugely helpful when in a comfortable and balanced system, but when unbalanced, it's dangerous and it's destructive. You don't need anybody's help to get these. Go for a run, achieve your goals, you'll get dopamine. You'll get endorphins but you won't have any feeling of fulfillment or love or trust. That's where these come in. These are attempting to manage these. This is what makes our society great. This is where people like Johnny Bravo come from. It's because of these two chemicals that leaders really fulfill their great responsibility. Outside in the world is danger at all times for various reasons. In caveman times, that danger may have been you know, a saber-toothed tiger. It may have been the weather. It may have been a lack of resources. It may have been, who knows, any number of things. Things that with no conscience are trying to kill you. They want to end your life. And so how do we survive? We work together. And together, we come together in our groups, in our companies, in our tribes, to feel like we belong, to be around people who believe what we believe, so that we may feel safe. 
When we're surrounded by people who have our best interests in mind and we feel safe, we will organize ourselves and cooperate to face the dangers externally. Don't forget, the outside dangers are a constant. In a modern world, the outside dangers may be your competition that's trying to put you out of business, or at least steal your business. It might be the ebbs and flows of the economy. It might be terrorism. All of these unknowns, all trying to put you out of business, take away your job, take away your livelihood, end it for you. Nothing personal. It's a constant. Inside our organizations, the dangers we face are not a constant. They are a variable. And they are the decisions of leadership as to how safe they make us feel when we go to work. This is the job of leaders. Aesop said it better than I can. There's an Aesop fable about four oxen that stand tail to tail. And whenever the lion tries to eat them, no matter what angle from which he attacks, he will always be met with horns. However, due to infighting and disagreements, they separate and they go and graze in different parts of the field. And one by one, the lion picks them off and kills them all. When we stand together, we can more easily face the dangers outside. When we break up inside our companies, if our leaders don't allow us a space to feel safe inside our own companies, to feel like we belong, then we have to. We're forced to exert our own energy to protect ourselves from each other. And by the way, expose ourselves to greater danger from the outside. If you have to worry, worry about politics, if you have to worry about someone stealing your credit, if you have to worry about your boss not having your back, think about the energy you invest, not in your business, not in the products you're trying to develop, not in your work, not in how great you're producing, not in your creativity, but in just keeping yourself feeling safe. This is destructive. The responsibility of leadership is two things. One, to determine who gets in and who doesn't get in. This is what it means to start with why. What are our values? What are our beliefs? Who can we allow in? Second thing is to decide how big this is. How big do we make the circle of safety? How big do we make the circle of belonging? Do we keep it around just our C-level executives and call it an inner circle and allow others to try and fend for themselves and maybe try and get into our inner circle? Or do we extend it to the outermost edges of the organization? Great leaders extend the circle of safety, the circle of belonging, out to the outermost edges. So the most junior person feels like they belong, feels safe, feels like they have top cover from somebody like Johnny Bravo. That's what these other two chemicals are trying to do. Serotonin is the leadership chemical, is the responsible for feelings of pride and status. When you, this is why public recognition is very important. We are social animals and we need the recognition of others. This is why we have the Oscars and this is why we have public awards uh, events. This is why we have commencement for graduation. I mean, think about it. What does it really take to get to graduate college? You need to pay your bills, fulfill the minimum requirements and, and, and collect enough credits. That's it, right? It's a formula. You could get an email that says, congratulations, you fulfilled all the requirements for graduation. In close, please print out the PDF of your diploma. PS, magna cum laude, right? Wouldn't feel so good, right? So instead, we have a big ceremony to recognize the accomplishment. And in the audience, we put our family and our friends and our teachers, all of those in our tribe who've supported us and watched our backs as we've made it through. And then we show up on that day and we go up on that stage and we take our diploma. It feels great. We feel our status rise. We feel our pride go up. And by the way, when you have serotonin in your veins, your confidence goes up also. And here's the best part about serotonin. At the exact moment that you took your diploma and you felt that surge of serotonin go through your body, at the exact moment your parents sitting in the audience also got a surge of serotonin and also felt an intense pride watching you graduate. And this is what serotonin is trying to do. It is trying to reinforce the relationship between parent and child, boss and employee, coach and player, the caregiver and the one who is, is, is grateful for the support they are given. And think about it. Think of the speeches that we, we give. If you give an award to somebody, what do they say? I couldn't have done it. I thank God. I thank my parents. I thank my coach. We thank the person who we believe was looking out for us. We could not have done this without them, we say. And they look at us and they say, I'm so proud of you. And we work to make them proud. Great teams don't want to win the trophy. Great teams want to win one for the coach. They want to make the coach proud. 
We want to make our parents proud. And it raises our status, and it raises our confidence, and it feels good, and we in turn will look after others so that they may accomplish the same. This is what serotonin is trying desperately to do. The problem is, you can trick serotonin. We live in a materialist society, so we judge status very often in our country based on how much money you make, right? So any conspicuous display of wealth raises your status. This is why they put the logos on the outside. No good on the inside, nobody can see them. We want the red line of our, of our Prada glasses. How good, you, you own a pair of designer shoes, how good does it feel to put on your Gucci shoes? Oh my God, it feels so good. You walk out and you feel a million bucks. You can actually feel your confidence rise when you put on, you put on the stuff, right? Because it's showing this display of status. It feels great. The problem is there was no real relationship that was reinforced because of it. You tricked the system. That's why we keep trying to accomplish things and ac accumulate more and more material goods and yet we never feel successful because there was no relationship. We tricked it. We gamed it. Serotonin is the leadership chemical. The reason I call it the leadership chemical is a historical reason, a very simple historical reason. We had a very practical problem as our animal was developing, as the Homo sapien was developing. We lived in communities of about 100 and 150 people. And there's a very practical issue, which is if we're hungry and somebody brings back food, and drop a carcass on the floor, we're all going to rush in to eat. And if you're lucky enough to be built like a linebacker, you will elbow your way to the front. And if you're the artistic one of the family, you get the elbow in the face. Not a good system to keep the whole tribe alive and definitely not a good system for cooperation. Because remember, the value of group living means that if I trust you and you trust me, I can fall asleep at night and trust that you will alert me to danger. If I don't trust you, I can't go to sleep at night. It's the same in our companies. If we trust each other, we will turn our backs, we will take risks, we will innovate, we will do things that will change the course of our world. If I don't trust you, I can't do that. I can't do that. There's value in group living and group working. And so if you got an elbow in the face that afternoon, odds are very high that you're not gonna wake the guy who punched you if danger's there. You're just not gonna do it. Bad system. And so we evolved into hierarchical animals. We're constantly assessing and judging each other, constantly arranging ourselves. Who's the alpha? Who's the dominant? Who's the one who, who sort of is the, is, the, is the more dominant personality or dominant uh, uh, talent in the room? In caveman times, it might have been physical muscle. In a creative industry, it might be talent. In you know, the military, it might be courage. There's no standard by which we uh, judge alphas. It's relative to the industries we're in and it's relative to us as well. If you've ever met someone and you were nervous while you were meeting them, you're not the alpha. We've all had the experience where we're meeting somebody and we can sense that they're nervous meeting us. You're the alpha. I'll tell you a little aside that's kind of funny. You know when women all live together, their uh, menstrual cycles um, align, right? Assuming they're not on the pill, then it doesn't work, right? But if they're not on the pill, that all the menstrual cycles go together on the same schedule. It's not arbitrary. They always align with the alpha female's schedule. And the reason is, is because when a woman is in her menstrual cycle, she can't bear children. And so in evolutionary terms, you want the alpha male and the alpha female to, to do it so you can have alpha children, right? Nice, strong, strapping kids are going to survive. But if she's off the market, that produces competition. So Mother Nature has in, in, uh, created a very clever way that when she's off the market, everyone's off the market. <laughs> Back to the talk. <laughs> so we're constantly judging and assessing each other who's alpha, right? And what we do is when we assess that someone else is the alpha, we voluntarily take a step back and allow them to eat first. Alphas get first choice of meat and first choice of mate. Good system. Good system. The alpha gets to eat first. The rest of us may not get the best cut of meat, but we will get to eat eventually and we won't get an elbow in the face. Good system. We'll happily alert them to danger later. Good system. This is why we're constantly trying to raise our status, is because there are benefits to being the alpha. People will do things for us and step back and offer us favors, right? We, we're, and we, we, to this day, we're perfectly comfortable giving special treatment to our alphas. No one has a problem that your boss makes more money than you. You might think he's an ass, but you don't have a problem that he makes more money. Nobody has a problem that somebody outrank, who outranks us at work has a bigger office than us. 
doesn't offend us. It is deeply ingrained in us. We happily step aside and allow our alphas first choice of meat and first choice of mate. It's good to be the king. There are advantages that come with being the alpha. You get special treatment. You get to eat first. People show you love and respect. It boosts the serotonin. You walk around like this. It boosts your confidence. It's awesome. But it comes at a cost. You see, the group is not stupid. We're not giving all of that stuff away for free. Leadership, alpha, comes at a cost. You see, we expect that when danger threatens us from the outside, that the person who's actually stronger, the person who's better fed, and the person who is actually teeming with uh, serotonin and actually has higher confidence than the rest of us, we expect them to run towards the danger to protect us. This is what it means to be a leader. The cost of leadership is self-interest. If you're not willing to give up your perks when it matters, then you probably shouldn't get promoted. You might be an authority, but you will not be a leader. Leadership comes at a cost. You don't get to do less work when you get more senior. You have to do more work. And the more work you have to do is put yourself at risk to look after others. That is the anthropological definition of what a leader is. This is why we're so offended by these banker boys who pay themselves astronomical salaries. It has nothing to do with the number. It has to do with the fact that they have violated a deep-seated social contract. We know that they made all of that money and allowed their people to be sacrificed. In fact, they may have sacrificed their people for the money. If I told you we're going to give $150 million to Nelson Mandela, would anyone have a problem with that? Nope. $250 million to Mother Teresa. Got an issue with it? Nope. It's not the number. It's not the amount of money they make. It's that we are deeply and viscerally offended that we know that we allowed them to have this alpha position and they did not fulfill their responsibility of the alpha. They're supposed to sacrifice themselves for us, never sacrifice us for themselves.